let me tell you something about black magic. First, it's quite real. And second, it's like fly paper. You touch it, you can never escape. You can never escape. An organization touches it. That organization is part of it. That's today's guest, Whitley Strieber, who I would maintain is one of the most important figures in our who are we, why are we here history. Here's a clip from the 1989 movie Communion, which was based on his New York Times number one best-selling book of the same name, which really doesn't even give it credit in terms of the significance it had to our culture, but nonetheless, here's the clip. Group? People have seen the same sort of things you have. Which group of aliens abducted you? Bob, we are not victims. We are participants. So there's some pretty dark stuff there, but Whitley does offer a path forward, a way out of the vortex. There's only one way to escape, and that is to live a life of love, compassion, and humility. If you do not actively work on that, you will not escape. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Akaris, and today we welcome Whitley Strieber to Skeptic Co. He's here to talk about his new book, which we have up on the screen there on Amazon, A New World. Very affordably priced. I haven't got a little discount on mine, but eight bucks. Just an unbelievably classic book, but we'll get into that in a minute. And uh, we might also learn what's going on with his very excellent website, Unknown Country, and of course, his podcast that I'm sure many of you have checked out at various times, Dreamland. So, you know, before we jumped into all that, I wanted to pause for a minute and bring a little bit of perspective to today's talk. Because, you know, as I've kind of said on this show, there really are only two questions. Who are we and why are we here? So if you go look at science, that's all science really fundamentally is ever asking. That's all philosophy is ever asking. You might even say that's all religion is ever asking. And if you look at those two questions and you look at this new now disclosed reality about the lights in the sky, about the craft that has been video released on the Department of Defense and the New York Times and all the, the news rep, the news reporters. It's on mainstream news, everybody. And if we think how fundamentally that has shifted, that has answered, or at least begun to answer those two questions, who are we, why are we here? And then you ask yourself, name one person, one person who you would say is most at the center of that monumental shift in all of history of answering those two questions, paradigm shift. Now we have a whole new way of answering them. Whitley Strieber has to be in there. I mean, he has to be, I, I think he's the one, but he's certainly one of the very few. So there aren't a lot of uh, seminal events in this kind of paradigm shift, this new understanding of who we are and why we're here. But maybe if we were just going to pick out three of them randomly, we'd say, okay, maybe Roswell, that certainly kind of was a paradigm shift. No matter what you think about Roswell, no matter what your opinion is. A second one would be the current round of, I don't know, <laughs> disclosure, I guess we could call it, that we're going through. The, the, some people call it a PSYOP, but it certainly is an official, semi-official disclosure. But the third event would have to be the publication of Whitley's book, Communion, which if people don't remember, because they're not older, <laughs> when Communion was in the bookshelves, back when they had bookstores, it stopped people in their tracks. 
they were not, not, not mesmerized, I was going to say, but that isn't the correct word. They were, they were transformed by their real memories of things that had happened to them. That's how significant that book was. It shifted our whole perception of this phenomenon from a nuts and bolts technology phenomenon to an experiencer phenomenon. Whitley did that. And then he changed it again along the way, just by his own raw discovery and sharing that discovery with us. He shifted it again to a consciousness centered experience saying that it's not just about the experience, it's about what the experience means at that consciousness level. And then finally, if you've followed his work in the last few years, he shifted it again in the most significant way from a consciousness centered, which really means mind for a lot of people, to an extended consciousness perspective. The work with his departed wife, Anne, and her near-death experience, and then her after-death communication. And Whitley's ongoing extended consciousness communication with these ones that he calls the visitors and what that means at a deep, dare I say, spiritual level, but we have to because that's what it's at. It's phenomenal, phenomenal person in our, in our history, which we just don't, we just don't appreciate it. Do you have any any thoughts on your position in all this, your legacy position or anything like that? Yeah, I certainly thought about it a lot. Uh, you know, how did I end up dropped into this particular bag? <laughs> I was uh, not living a life that was connected with this in any way when I was, uh, when, when it happened. At least that's not, I thought I wasn't, but that wasn't the case. Uh, my uncle and, and, and my father were involved in the, in the whole secret world in some ways. My uncle pretty much opened up to me and introduced me to General Arthur Exxon, who and I based what they told me, I based my no novel Majestic on what they told me about Roswell and the aftermath of Roswell. And since then, I've pretty well gotten the whole story straight. So I have a, a, a really quite accurate timeline from there to here. And uh, the difficulty has been that I've been asked to keep uh, secrets in, in, in some cases, and there are therefore holes in the narrative. And I'm hoping that I will get some kind of closure uh, on this at some point. But as far as my personal life is concerned, I wrote a book years ago called The Secret School, which is a sort of an exploration of strange childhood memories, or are they memories? I've never been sure. Some of them I'm pretty sure of. Ironically, the one I'm most sure of, I did not mentioned in the book because I didn't remember it when I was writing the book, only later. And that is that I was in some kind of very intense and very uh, disturbing ex educational program as a little boy. I, I thought at first it happened in 1947 when I was, uh, would have been three or four, would have been four, uh, but it actually happened in 1952. And it involved, a, yeah, it, it using something called a Skinner box, exactly. And uh, I was very unsure about this memory until I mentioned it to a man who was in, a, in an entirely different world, an entirely different career path from mine, a very successful man one of the world leaders in his field, who also happens to be arguably my closest friend. And uh, we have been friends since childhood and our family friendship, you know, in the Southeast and, and anywhere in the country for that matter, these family 
friendships can go back a long time, it goes back three generations now. And our kids and grandkids are the fourth and fifth generations. So it's a long friendship. And I trust him deeply. I trust him, I would trust him with my soul. Uh, and I mentioned it to him and to my amazement, he said, well, you know, they tried to recruit me too. I was seven when this happened. He was nine, and, and there's a great deal of difference between the mind of a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old. He remembers very well being in the room when the two Air Force people, a man and a woman, who his parents knew, they were friends, tried to recruit him for the program. And they, they pitched it as a program for extremely bright children, and that there would only be a few people in San Antonio selected for it, only five or six children. And uh, he was one of them because they had, uh, the Air Force had been behind the general, general IQ testing of children. Aren't you lucky? Aren't you the lucky one? Not, not really. But, and you know, when I heard you, when I heard you, uh, the first time I heard you tell this story, I was stunned by the, your openness about struggling to come to grips with it and how the account of your friend and his parents who basically said, get the hell out of here. You're not putting my son in any Skinner box. I don't care what you call it. And what you keep adding to the story, which are, is, is just revealing more and more layers, Whitley. It's not like you're adding anything to the story. You're revealing more about the story. But the two yes. things I just want you to touch on about that story was, uh, number one, that you're, for, 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 it's a, a horrible word, complicit, but your family was complicit in this at a level that you didn't understand until you were much older. So there was no option on they, their part. They had already kind of signed up for this. and We don't even know what they had done before but the other thing i, I remember know. the other thing i remember about your story that, that was particularly poignant to me and, and and i want you to retell it if it's true but you dressing up as your in your sunday best to you know go for the special program and sitting and yeah. waiting and doing that for the first weekend but then the second weekend you had this like fear no, and no, panic it, and the parents were like oh get ready whitley we're it, all ready no, and you're like not even knowing how to process that but saying this is not something that's right or good or proper well first of all a couple of logistical corrections it was thursday nights not weekends uh and it was and we were when mother began to dress us for this to get us to dress because she wanted us to look our best. My parents had no, they had not been told the truth about what was happening, I'm sure. Um, let, me, let me go back to the strange one thing. My father has to have been one of the most tight-lipped human beings who ever existed. He was very, very, kept everything, everything very close to the chest. But um, Colonel Guy Hicks, who was the officer in command uh, when, when uh, Captain Mantell, back in 19, in the early 50s, uh, flew uh, uh, his Mustang toward a UFO and crashed. And it's a famous UFO incident, the Mantell incident. His family ended up living just down the, just a, just a block away from us, and my father and mother specifically sent me over there to play with his children. And I remember perhaps them asking me questions about it, but I, I don't remember in any detail. Uh, but what was going on that he was even there? And there was an FBI agent who lived down the street across the street from us. So something was up. It, it, that, and you're right, I think, when you say there was some kind of locomotion there, I don't think my parents realized how traumatic this was going to be. I, they probably didn't know what a Skinner box was, but the other parents, the, the husband was a trial lawyer and he had been involved in a brainwashing case. And so he knew everything there was to know about mind control and mind changing systems and so forth. So that was why he, they declined uh, to let their child go into this. It was pitched to the parents as 
he tells me, I don't remember, my parents never mentioned anything about what they had been told uh, as a real honor, you know, that, and, and, but they took my sister and a boy who lived across the street with us, with me, because they, what they were really going to do was not pleasant and they, they needed, I think they needed the, 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 some companionship for me because I think I would have been too panicked to function had I not had other children who were familiar to me with me. As I recall, there may have been other children involved and I have all kinds of weird, half imaginary, half maybe real memories of, uh, of uh, that I don't discuss because they're too vague and too incendiary really. But I do remember one time being uh, so upset that they took me to the flight line. And uh, now this did happen on a weekend. And they, they, the dad took me out to the base, to the Air Force base, and uh, they showed me around. And they were very nice to me. And they took me to the flight line and let me sit in a Sabre jet. And, and they were trying to make my make me more comfortable there. And, but that didn't work. And this, the, the program started in August, just before school started, about two weeks before school started, I think. And by October, my immune system had completely collapsed and I was getting sickness. I, I was getting cold after cold, disease after disease. My mother took me to our doctor and he told her that I had no white blood cells. And she mentioned, she talked about this before, and the result was that I was taken not to uh, 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 a, a, a hospital uh, uh, like, a local, like, like a local children's hospital, I was taken to Brook General Hospital, the military hospital. And I was isolated there for about, uh, uh, maybe three or four days. I know mother came and slept with me one night or maybe all nights, I don't know. And I was given shots of glamoglobulin. Then I was taken home and not allowed to go to school and not allowed to see any other children until, uh, the, until the January of that year came. I was, I was out of school until January. That was in October. And I was no longer in the program. So that's that that's what happened i attri i attribute the visitors coming into my life somehow or another to that program allow me to kind of lay out a couple of connections that i've stumbled upon and yeah, i please. want you to comment them on because you have you've laid out these threads but i appreciate that you are reluctant to stitch things together in a neat and tidy way when it doesn't belong in a neat and tidy way. And I really respect yeah, you that. You can't only do that. Then you're, then you're living an illusion. Well, and, and, and that's why we, we trust you. And that's why, you know, in your book, you, you say at the beginning that you're not a liar and you don't uh, tolerate, <laughs> you don't tolerate liars. And I love that. No, because I don't. That's what we need. So a couple of pieces to string together here. One, of course, is the MK Ultra program, which all indications would seem to point to the fact that this was part of the MK Ultra program. People have looked into it, know that, you know, it's not just a couple of doctors up there in Canada fooling around. There are 150 programs at least that we traced before they shut down all the information many places throughout the United States. One of the little tidbits that I picked up from uh, UFO researcher Grant Cameron, who uh, I, I, I like and respect, and he had a great point about the Wilbert Smith memo that was pretty famous and was released back in the 50s through a Freedom of Information Act. I won't repeat that story because I've told it so many times and I'm sure you know it, but you know, he's a Canadian, he's working the Canadian weird desk, if you will. And finally, he, enough UFO stuff piles up on his desks that he he's, tells his boss, I need to go down to the States. And he goes down and he meets Vandevar Bush and he meets all these other guys. And they say, you got some good stuff. So you're in the club. We can tell you a little bit about what's going on. And they say, yeah, this is the main thing. The UFO thing is the thing. 
<coughs> pardon me, but what he throw what what is in the Wilbert Smith memo to his boss that was never supposed to be public is the last sentence says they understand it to be a mental phenomenon and are pursuing it in those lines. And he suspects, and I agree with him, that the rise and the impetus for the MK Ultra program was at least partially, if not significantly, driven by the fact that they had made some kind of contact and they had immediately had to give up this idea of this materialistic, you are a biological robot, in a meaning, because they were speaking or communicating telepathically. And then they, in typical military fashion, then it became, okay, how do we do it? How do we weaponize it? And so that's one thread I want you to pick up on. But the other thread that's really sad is the splitting, is the disassociative identity disorder and the weaponization of that, yeah, as we've learned through cult practices, through satanic, satanic ritual abuse practices, in the very real way that we study it among criminals who do that, that this is somehow, in some way we don't completely understand, a tool, a mechanism to crack people open to somehow make them more pliable in this extended consciousness realm that, again, we don't completely understand. Well, I think that what happened to me in that three or four month period cracked the cosmic egg. I know it shattered my sister and it shattered the boy from across the street. It ruined their lives. And I attribute, they both had very <laughs> difficult lives. And I attribute it to this because I don't see there's anything else to explain it. It was a very placid, normal, 1950s neighborhood, you know, in other words, there was nothing there except this that to make them what they became. And uh, the boy across the street lived at home. He barely, he had sort of a marriage, but he was, he lived in, in, the, in the room he grew up in until the day he died at 53. And he was interviewed by Edward Conroy and he mentioned remembering something about our childhood that I think was verifying in a way that somebody didn't like. And that's my theory, because it, of course, he, what I'm going to tell you is it involves a VA hospital, so it could have just been malpractice. But uh, he fell off a ladder and went to the VA hospital, and they loaded him up with so much uh, cortisone that he died. And I don't know if they murdered him or if it was malpractice, could have been either. Um, but uh, the, the, and my sister had a very difficult life. She could never settle somehow. To my knowledge, neither of them had any memory of the events that took place in, uh, in at Randolph. And I'm, they both died before I, uh, my, the uh, neighbor died before I remembered it. And my sister didn't have any memory of it. I asked her about it when she was alive. She's passed on now. But what I think is this with regard to MK Ultra. When the files were released, the judge ordered or uh, allowed the withholding of a, quite a number of records which are still classified and still are hidden away at this point. I'm not sure they can be legally classified anymore. I think it was 44 boxes of files. In other words, a lot of files. I believe that these files probably included, maybe among other things, uh, material about this type of program. And they were withheld because it was so incendiary that children had been involved, but children still are involved. It's not over. It's not over. And you know, and you talk about ritual abuse and the bizarre story of the finders comes to mind, which you may have discussed on your show before. Uh, it, it, yeah, you're nodding. So I'm, I won't go into it in too much detail, 
but I know an enormous amount about it. Um, uh, the, the, and, and this program was very like, in some ways, I think, what, what was done to us. And what was so very chilling to me was when I read the Finder's material first, when it first showed up years ago, back in the, in the, in the 80s, I was shocked, of course, but then later when I remembered my experiences more clearly back in the, in the late 90s of Randolph, there was more to it than that. There was also a trip to Mexico, to Monterey. When, would, when does that fit into the time frame? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I must have been, it must have been during that same period probably in my seventh year. Uh, and it was in the, it was, I remember the flight was very exciting to me because we, I believe we drew, drove to El Paso, to uh, Laredo and then flew to Monterey, but it was on a wonderful, one of those old Ford trimotors, a, an old airplane, which in those days were still flying in Mexico. Uh, they, they were not, you know, this was, this was the early fifties. And so they were still in operation. And I found that very exciting. Um, in any case, in the finders material, you will find that the children said that they were, they were, had recruit, been recruited because they were super intelligent and they were on their way to Mexico. And that shocked me and frightened me. And the reason is I have, which I am not going to go into detail about because I don't know their, 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 their locomotion within my mind, I have horrifying memories of that place. Uh, when I went to Mexico with my wife some years ago, uh, we stopped in Monterey. We stayed at the same hotel I had stayed in with my sister and dad, the Grand Ancira. Really? What, why and did you choose to do that? I wanted to, well, we were, we were going to, uh, meet friends in, um, in, in Mexico. We, I, I, I'm part Mexican, so I have a lot of Mexican friend, friends and family. But why and, go back uh, to that same hotel? Was it closure for you? I, or? I, was trying to, I was trying to reignite the memories. I did it very intentionally. And then I also drove up and down the streets in the hills above Monterey, trying to, uh, trying to find the place, frankly, and I never did. I didn't find anything that that, uh, that that was connected, that 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 struck any familiar chord in my mind. I didn't see anything that I would say was that that oh that was the place. That was what I was trying. I was trying to re to to reconnect with with buried memories, basically, um, and I failed. Uh, but I, I'm sure that it that happened and. If it was, if the memories I have of it are true, then it was an absolute nightmare. And the purpose of it would have been to cause the children to feel guilty and to therefore uh, 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 cement their loyalty. I wrote a book called In Hitler's House uh, under a pseudonym of Jonathan Lane, which mentions something that Hitler called Blutkit, uh, the blood, uh, uh, blood uh, loyalty. Mm. And th the way this worked was when an, a person was inducted into the SS, they were made to do something really, really terrible that everyone else had done in the group. And then they f it made them feel part of the group and they had a horrible secret so terrible they could never tell anyone. This is also what was used in the recruiting of children in, uh, in uh, uh, Africa in, in, in the wars that used child armies. I mean, this so, is standard standard playbook. Gangs, blood in, blood it, out. Uh, you right, know, every exactly. criminal organization has picked up on it. It's been around for a long time. Doesn't make it 
better or anything like that. Um, no, but it, it, it was, I think it was first articulated by Hitler himself. And Can I interject a question? Because when you're yeah, talking about sure. the finders, and I don't want to trace that whole history for people can go back and find it in this show and in other places. And John Brisson was the guy we've interviewed who's done some terrific work, original research, interviewing uh, Martinez, who is the customs officer, his partner in DC, who kind of cracked the case. Here's what's interesting about the finders, which I'd like you to speak to, is the horror, the weaponization I don't take horror out of it because it immediately throws people off. The weaponization of these extended consciousness realms bleeds together into multiple purposes, like you're saying. One, hey, it, it silences people. They're bonded now. They can't, they're bonded through fear. They're traumatized and they can't do that. It also creates a situation where, you know, in the finders cult, we can now find, hey, isn't this a tool to blackmail other people, you know, and the, do a Jeffrey Epstein brownstoning operation way back then, which they were doing. But again, cross purposes. But the third aspect of it, which I think is really most intriguing to me, and I suspect it is to you too, because I've seen your writing on it, is the breaking open, the cracking open in order to create uh, an entry point for extended consciousness, including the visitors, including what we would call demonic beings. And again, this is, uh, I interviewed, you know, Dr. Tom Zinzer is a clinical psychologist in Grand Rapids, Michigan, who worked 20 years with a lot of people with dissociative identity disorder and men of, many of them satanic ritual abuse victims. And that is exactly his finding, is that th that's why they do it. They intentionally try and create this DID situation because without even fully understanding it, they know it creates an entry point. And I, I wonder if we were, as horrible as it is, if our intelligence organizations had halfway figured that out and were fooling around with how to create that, that entry point. You know, let me, let me tell you something about black magic. First, it's quite real. And second, it's like flypaper. You touch it, you can never escape. You can never escape. An organization touches it, that organization is part of it. Everyone a country? A country too. And it, it, the more you try to escape from it, the deeper you get. There's only one way to escape, and that is to live a life of love, compassion, and humility. If you do not actively work on that, you will not escape. And you have these this whole community of people who are, who are so arrogant. I know many people in intelligence work. I grew up in, in a family that was involved in it, for God's sakes. And it makes people arrogant. To, if, if, you can, if you can know secrets that your neighbor can't know, it feeds the ego in a very sick way. You have to work hard to be humble. You know, the first lesson the visitors, when the visitors really started to work with me, the, the grays, I mean, uh, the first lesson was a lesson in humility. Now, the dark side is extremely clever, and it would know that I might be drawn in to accepting it as not the dark side, because it gave me lessons in things like humility and compassion. But you have to live those lessons. And it might it very well give you those lessons in an effort to recruit you into something very dark, in, or to trick you into believing it's the, the, the demons want to trick you into believing they're angels. But if you get deeper than that, you find you're in control. You can control it. And these, all of these asses 
who were trying and are trying to basically engage the dark side on behalf of the United States of America have failed in that respect, in my opinion. And you keep seeing little things bleed out like the, like the Jeffrey Epstein stuff and the, uh, and the, the, the uh, recruitment that took place for years inside the Catholic Church, which has been, been publicly exposed as ritual abuse. But the, but the deeper processes of recruitment that were involved have never been publicly exposed and probably never will be, but they, they are there in my opinion. And then the Epstein case, what happened to all of the videos? There's a silence has come about that. Who has them? I remember back years and years ago, you know, my family had a lot of connections politically in Texas, and there was much laughter about the fact that LBJ had gotten a hold of some film of uh, J. Edgar Hoover dancing around in a dress. And that film resulted in Johnson getting a hold of all of Hoover's files, Hoover's secret files on politics. Johnson took over from Hoover, basically. And uh, uh, then later, of course, it was revealed that it was all quite true, and Hoover was a cross-dresser, and there were big parties, FBI parties, with cross-dressing and stuff. People who do those things, there's nothing wrong with it now. In other words, it, we, we've, 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 uh, we've disenfranchised that as an evil act. But in those days, it was extremely secret and considered very, very perverse and bizarre. And that's how the people who needed to do it, the, these poor people, thought of themselves, including someone like Hoover. Um, and, uh, yeah, but I, I think Hoover was was pretty dark in other ways too. It's not just a guy who liked. Oh yeah, to, you know, he, he, so he 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 like so many of those victims became a perpetrator, right? I mean, it's Alex. It's ego, 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 uh, ego. You have to work hard to understand that you are not your ego. What you're talking about is your spiritual journey in your spiritual yes. practice. And I think we should be explicit about that because it's, it's ego in the sense that ego is getting in the way of your true, divine, love-filled spirit. Right. But I know you, you know that. Hey, let me, let me direct you to a couple of questions that I think are from your book, A New World, which again is phenomenal. It's seminal. It's, 150 pages. You can get more in 150 pages here to kind of turn your world upside down again, you know, even if it's already turned upside down in a good way. But one of the things that people, you've returned to this already in our conversation, you've touched on this two or three times, but it's a question that I know pops up. It did for me whenever I hear you talk and whenever I hear your journey from being you know, not just horrified, but uh, completely outraged uh, at the at the visitors, um, mad at the visitors, scared as hell at the visitors, to kind of a different kind of evolving relationship with the visitors. But what is at the center of this is uh, the quote from A New World is, when a shark devours an innocent swimmer, it is terrible, but it isn't evil. It's just nature being nature. The same thing holds true when a person is attacked in the night, their spine extracted, and their energetic body captured. It's just nature being nature. Yeah, the, that particular passage is about something that I'm fairly sure happened and happens. It is a where, and it's related to the cattle mutilations, where the um when 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 the visitors some will sometimes take me out of my body and when they do that i can feel a shock going down my spine as the places between 
that, that hold this, the, elect, the electromagnetic body, if you will, or the second body to the first body are opened. And then I come right out and I'm still conscious. I'm well able to function in the world. Uh, I can be seen often by people. I've interacted with people. I uh, was seen by Linda Howe, much to her annoyance one time. I've been seen and interacted with other people as well. Uh, so it's, it's quite real. But what is this? And now there are predatory levels of this whole thing. There's a whole world outside of the physical world, a bigger world filled with entities. And I think some of those entities are just like sharks. I mean, they're like, they're like almost, almost not, not they're, let's call them brilliant animals. And they will, they will attack people. They are predators. They attack cattle. Then they occasionally attack human beings. I think that when they they do attack human beings, it, it, they are stopped. Uh, I I think that there's a case uh, there that, that the cases I mentioned in a new world I think happened. I think they happened in Brooklyn, and I, I and I uh, I can't say much much about them because they're so they're so buried. But I don't think they happen all that often. I think they happen from time to time when people are vulnerable, but a particularly type of people. These were all people who had kind of no lives. In other words, they had, they were street people. They didn't have any associations, any, any friends or anything like that. And they, they were, they were basically, they were taken there were spines were damaged in this way that would have, it, as soon as you damage the spine that way, that second body is going to come right out. And if somebody is there who knows how to capture it, they will, or they can, and they use it as a form of energy. They eat it, apparently. What about the sexual assault that is reported over and over again? I experienced it. I, I know you did. I I, I yeah. totally I totally understand that you did. And uh, there's so there's also um, it might be easier to even talk about other cases other than your own. But you're welcome to talk about your case. But no, no, women, I, I, I know loads of cases. I've got hundreds of them in my files. What do you make of that? Particularly, it it just starts looking as a as below, so above. I mean. Uh, uh, publicly in, in this extended realm, publicly uh, sexually assaulting someone, dominating someone, uh, shifting, all that kind of stuff. It, it, it is deception. Right after the communion experience, I wrote a short story called Pain, which is about sexual domination. Because I was felt, I didn't never felt anything like sexual domination being dominated sexually before in my life until that night. And that's exactly how it felt. I mean, they they raped me. They induced an erection with a an electro with a, 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 a something like a like a, it's called an electro stimulator. Um, they they extracted semen from me. Uh, that, you talk about and I was totally and completely helpless the whole time. It was sexual domination. There's no question about that. that's what it was. But I I came to a point where I had to make a choice. I knew they were, at th this point, that they were real and they were either permanently part of the physical world and very clever at concealing themselves or they were something else that would project themselves into the physical world. I still can't tell you which exactly is the case, although I think that it's probably a mix of, there's probably a spectrum of, of, of this of some kind. But I had to make a choice. Either I was going to try to see what they were all about and to see if they would engage with me on some more acceptable level or not. And that's why I started walking out in the woods in the middle of the night, knowing what had happened to me at that point. I knew very well what they had done. And I did not know whether or not I would ever come back when I went out there because I thought they were incredibly dangerous. And I still do. I don't think that they're, it's all sweetness and light. And you know, you have these people out there who, who are basically kind of blaming us because we're scared, then they're 
you know, it, it, you have you have a lot of people in the UFO community who do CE fives and so forth, who are saying that they're all sweetness and light, but these are also people who had have very little empathy for other human beings, in my opinion, because it's not all sweetness and light. It's a hard experience, and making it. I've tried my best to make it something of value for me. But boy, I'm telling you right now, I'm not, I don't trust the visitors. I trust my innate goodness as a human being, that I do trust. But I do not trust them and I do not trust their various attempts to make themselves seem more angelic to me. I think that they got caught in a dark vortex a long time ago, some of them did, and they are trapped in it. And I'm not there. I am not trapped in it. And I am also not involved. I do not have Stockholm syndrome at all. I've, I've worried about that a lot because I don't want to be an apologist for monsters. And um, frankly, you can, you can make a choice. You can take what they have to dish out and make it your own and make it part of your growth and your, your exploration of your own ethical journey. Or you can fall into a trap, which is you can decide that they're really angels, or you can decide that there are demons and I don't want a goddamn thing to do with them. You can do those things. I chose the other path, the middle path. You know, there's so many uh, profound points to that that we're not going to be able to get into, but profound, profound, the vortex of evil that they are found themselves in and are ultimately trying to get out of. And I would tie that back to your flypaper comment that we may be entering in that same vortex and we'll find ourselves trying to find our way out of it, which maybe we are. Maybe we're not even to the point where we realize we do need to find our way out of it. The question I ask, because I've interviewed so many near-death experience researchers and I've found that that body of science, which it is at this point with over 200 peer-reviewed papers, so uh, meaningful to not only me, if somebody who's never ex never had a near-death experience, I know your wife did, I know it was key to her spiritual journey, and maybe we could talk about that. But the le one of the lessons we get from the near-death experience is that it is about this journey to and through the light, and that uh, what I find profound, uh, profound about that is the idea that, yes, you will be judged. You will be judged for every action, every thought, every deed, but not by someone else, but by yourself, by your soul, by that voice that has always been with us from the time we're a little kid, where we know what's right and what's wrong. So in the book, A New World, you have a grin, uh, just an opening here that we, you will, you will not close, which you shouldn't close because we don't have any complete closure on it. But here's the quote. What we would appear to be looking at then in both the close encounter and the near-death experiences is a massive increase in initiation. So do you want to speak about uh, near-death experience, its connection, yeah. or anything else there? Well, well, I would like to first speak about initiation and what it is. Uh, initiation is not fun. Uh, all the way back to the beginning of initiatory activities in this world, a real initiation involves a real challenge of death. When Jesus says, uh, he talks about in various ways of dying to this world and then you will never taste of death again. Uh, what he's talking about is an initiatory experience that causes you to face and live through death and come out on the other side knowing that you that there is more to this to this experience than the physical world 
Uh, and that's exactly what happened to Anne. She went, she had a massive stroke. Uh, she was, I was told by the doctors on the night they brought her in that she would not last until the morning, but they saved her. They did it. It wasn't a miracle. It was medical skill. And they brought her all the way back from the other side of death to this life again. And she had a near death experience in the, in the, um, in, in this process. It wasn't a classic near death experience going into the light or seeing the light, et cetera, and so forth. It was much more down to earth and Anne like she ended up in a bus station, which, which where she was seeing, saw people all sitting on benches with big parcels in their hands and she didn't have anything in her hands. And she was told she could either go on or come back if she wished. And she decided to come back. And after that, she was no longer afraid of death in any way. When it came time for her to go, her body was collapsing. I mean, her brain was, she was having stroke after stroke because of cancer, uh, uh, the result of their being unable to take a, a tumor entirely out of her brain. And the weight of the tumor was destroying her brain. And she had lost, lost the entire right side of her body, left side, yeah, yeah, left side of her body. And she said to me one day in July of 2015, Whitley, it's time, I'm going. And I said, I was just heartbroken, of course, because I wanted Anne with me physically in any form she happened to be, sick or healthy. But I could well understand she couldn't even get up out of bed. She had to be helped to do everything. And that would be the case until something ghastly happened, like she became locked in or uh, her lungs stopped working and she died of suffocation. And so I called hospice and they came and they talked to Anne. And at that point I was, I had to be out of the picture legally. We didn't have, you, you didn't have, you had to, you had to, if you're going to intentionally die in those days, you had to stop eating, you had to refuse food and water because the Supreme Court had decided if you did that, then you had the right to, you can, no, you couldn't be stopped. And so that's what she did. And she only lasted a few days and those were the hardest and most extraordinary days of my life. She came back, she died at 7.15. She began reconnecting with me through friends at 9.30 that night. She didn't come directly to me because she knew I was too hard-headed. I would never have believed it. But now I have learned how to share this body with her. She can use it. This is why symbolically I wear both rings, because as far as I'm concerned, we're still married. We're just down to this one body. Anyway, it's all in um, the book I wrote with Anne after she died, The Afterlife Revolution. And you know, there's such wisdom. She's had given me such wisdom in, in her afterlife. Among the things that she said that are great are, the human species is too young to have beliefs. What we need are good questions. And, but the other one that I think is, it has, it's a, it's a life aim that is not reachable probably in life, but is a, a wonderful aim to have. It is that enlightenment is what happens when there is nothing left of us but love. You start down that path and immediately the dark side's having trouble with you. <laughs> Whitley, you got me choked up. Huh. Um, oh, me too. Tell us, tell us what's going on with, uh, with you. What else is going on? This new book, again, people are going to want to check out A New World. And of course, the website, what's going on there? And what's next? What's next for you? I am writing a book about Jesus. It is not like other books about Jesus. Are you, is the historical aspect of Jesus important to you or 
are you okay with those who understand Christ consciousness, but are a little bit less sold on the historical aspects, the way it's been told to us? What's your opinion? There are two histories of Jesus. There, there are three histories of Jesus. One is the secular history of Jesus, which you can get in a book like uh, uh, Zealot by Riza Aslan, uh, which is essentially that he was a revolutionary. There was no, there were no real miracles. There was no resurrection. All that is uh, just uh, hyperbole. Or there is the traditional Christian Jesus. He was a God come to earth. There's another Jesus that is unremarked, but more important. Three things have happened that caused that other Jesus to reemerge. As he said, if you do not awaken, I will return as a thief in the night. One is the Shroud of Turin. The moment the first photograph was taken of it in 1898, suddenly we had a picture of him. The second is the Gospel of Thomas, and the third is the Gospel of Mary. Those three things taken together add up to a new vision of Jesus. The uh, Shroud of Turin was debunked in 1988 as being a medieval forgery. This is false. It is not a medieval forgery. And there is plenty of science that has been done since then that shows that it is indeed an extremely strange object. It's the strangest thing in the world. But it doesn't mean that Jesus was a god. It means that we don't know what we are. Just as you said at the beginning, this is the central aim of human life, <coughs> finding out who we are. And my new book about Jesus is about just that. It's about using the example Jesus set to find out who we are. And as far as the idea that he didn't actually exist at all, well, that's a very interesting question that I address in the book extensively. I think there was a historical Jesus. And I think that, that the story, the real story of the historical Jesus is also a story about a group of initiates who worked with him, who you can find if you do a lot of detective work and careful reading of the Gospels. You can find their presence. They're like a shadow in the Gospels. They don't really emerge, but I, I, brought, I shined a light on them in my book, I hope. Um, when will that be out? That's going to really be interesting, you know, because let me just interject here a little bit. What I always think is interesting about the Jesus thing, and it's mainly because of my work, my interest in near-death experience science, and I always throw science in there because there's still a lot of people who are don't understand that it, just because we don't understand something completely, just because we don't understand consciousness, just because we don't understand what Anne experienced in that bus station, yeah, doesn't mean that it isn't, it isn't what we would term real, you know. But I've interviewed so many people that have had experiences with Christ consciousness, and they have a knowing. And I always want to say that I totally accept that on a very, very real level, that not, it's not just what they believed, that there is definitely a reality to that. But I love the yes. way that, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I hear you saying is you remain open to that not paralleling a, a historical figure in the way that in particular Christianity has stitched that story together uh, and that there may be discoveries that we need to make to understand the connection between that Christ consciousness that we are a co-creator of and, uh, and the historical thing there. So uh, any, any thoughts on that before we leave that? And then do tell us when that book will be out. Well, uh, I'm shooting for January the 15th. I, uh, that right now is the pub date, uh, but it might, it might, go a little longer. I'm not sure. I'm still fighting with myself about the title. And um, that's always hard because it has to have the right title. The title has to tell the story of the book in two or three words. Um, and I, I've always been good at titles, but I always feel 
that I'm terribly bad at titles when I'm working on one. So maybe a good title will come soon, and in, in which case we'll stay on track. Uh, now, the, the question of what initiation is, is central to an understanding not only of our own experience now, because after all, as Annie had a near-death experience and was brought back by doctors, this is now commonplace. This happens all the time. Uh, it, this had to be induced, say, in the mysteries in ancient times. You really did have to be put in a position where you were dying. And if you lived, then you had been initiated. And if you died, then that turned out to have been a mistake. Uh, and there was one tribe, and I, I forget which one, where someone wanting to gain medicine, medicine would jump off a cliff. And if they lived, they had medicine. And if they didn't, well, they, they made a mistake. Um, initiation is about getting past death. And it used to be very rare because, you know, how many people are going to actually, de actually do that? Now it's common because medical science has made it common. This is an initiatory culture now because we bring so many people back from the death, from death. Most of them don't actually remember anything, but some do, and those are initiates who do, who do remember. And Whitley, you were drawing some parallels earlier in the book, and I'd like you to kind of just string that out as our time is running out here. Between that and the increased contact with the visitors, because both are initiatory, yes. obviously initiatory, are, is there, you know, correlation causation kind of thing going on there? Or do they just happen? Or are we misreading that? Well, no, I don't think so. There's a real, very much of a correlation. The visitor experience is initiatory in the sense that it overturns your life. And you have a choice. Either you're going to sit there and say, well, God damn them or you're going to go for it and try to figure out what the hell happened and how you can make something out of it for yourself, or you're just going to ignore it and the memory will fade and, and fade into a state of sort of PTSD. And, and there's a, I think the visitor experience is very extensive and that there is a huge subliminal level of PTSD in our, in our world and always has been and is one of the reasons our history is so violent. You know, they're a, they're a big presence. It's not like a l bunch of little aliens running around and trying to see what we're up to. This is part of the, of the, of the blood of life. It's that deep. And it emerges from time to time in the, into physical entity. That happened in the distant past. Uh, uh, and you, you, that's why you see these images of entities that look something like the greys uh, from, from different periods. And you have uh, evidence in, in, uh, the, the, uh, in, the, in the literature of the past that there were contacts of various kinds. I mean, obviously, Ezekiel's wheel and so forth. And it's happening again. It's happening now. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a re, another initiation. I think we're going into a period of tremendous upheaval and that the soul, the greater soul that we are all part of is preparing for it. And that's why we see these things that we do. That's why there is a huge wave of initiation across the whole planet on so many different levels. Uh, and why those of us who know anything at all about what's going on have got to make a personal choice. You have to choose the good. You know, in the Gospel of Mary, the word God isn't mentioned. God is called the good. You have to choose the good. Well, what an awesome way maybe to end it right there. Um, folks, it's been or I should say Whitley, uh, just terrific. Thank you again so much. Our guest, of course, has been Whitley Strieber. Uh, you're going to want to check out his new book, 
a new world. You're going to want it. The guy's written over 40 books. So there's a lot to choose from. But this last one, important, relevant right now. And his website, it, excellent. Keeps walking, rocking along. Dreamland, uh, excellent as well. It's been just uh, awesome sharing this time with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Alex. It's been a pleasure. And I'm glad that we finally got together. Thanks again to Whitley Strieber for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I tee up is the question I kind of teed up at the beginning, and that's, what do you make of the flypaper analogy? What do you make of our need to know, our ego stroking, our ego run wild feeling of knowing, of being an intelligence agent, of being a magician, of being someone who knows more? Boy, I get it. I totally get it. But I wonder if it is, as Whitley says, black magic. If it is flypaper that sticks to us and keeps us in the vortex of evil. What do you think? Let me know. No one's coming over to the forum. I don't know. I don't know what's up. But uh, let me know by whatever means necessary. Got some good shows coming up. Stick around. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.